that uh, anybody can do a talk. If you love what the, you do, please get in touch. Please share. This is a warm room full of friends. So, um, no, the second half of the night, uh, we, we have Kieran Healy. Um, he's going to be talking about the nature of uh, human beings. And I, I know that he's writing a book and uh, various other things. Uh, he's going to be sharing uh, what he's invested his life in. Please do welcome him. Thank you all very much. There are the ideas that we discuss, the ideas we have conversations about, the ideas we argue about. And then there are the ideas beneath those, cultural assumptions on which our discussions sit. In ages past, those discussions, so those, uh, those foundations, those cultural assumptions, could be extremely elaborate and always were. Vast, vivid tapestries of belief that we inherited from our past. Sometimes it's tempting to look back on those tapestries as they exist in the modern age and think that they existed to enforce a power elite, a priestly caste or a monarchy. If I can control the belief structure, then I can reinforce my position. But there's another way to look at it. That the reason we create these vivid structures of certainty and belief that we defend from questioning isn't because they're imposed on us from the top down, but because they provide a context in which we can live in a certain way. A crusader swinging an axe into the face of a Muslim child commits an act that within the context of the ironclad certainties of medieval Christendom resonates with spectacular meaning. The purification of the Holy Land for Christ in the name of God. It doesn't take much to threaten that display. Yes, you can challenge this cultural tapestry, the certainties of it, and that will damage this crusader's spectacular display of virtue. But you don't even need to challenge it. You can just raise a question mark. Any question mark over how certain this structure of understanding, the context of the world is, can be fatal to the power and importance, the meaning of this crusader's life. From our point of view, he's not a spectacular warrior of Christ, even those of us who are Christian. The man is a terrifying fanatic in our modern times. What has changed? It's very tempting to think, and because of that a lot of, a lot of people inside traditional mindsets do, that the reason the traditional structures, these traditional belief tapestries are splintering and failing in the modern age is because they are under attack by factions, liberal factions, feminist factions, whatever. These factions that are undermining this crucial context 
within which we can imagine the meaning of our lives, which invests resonance and power. I talk about Christianity sometimes because that is the ancient belief system of our culture. But I believe that what I'm saying is equally applicable to Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, you know, all across the spectrum. The key thing is that in our time, what is challenging these belief structures, these tapestries, not the ideas we have out here that we discuss, but the ground beneath our feet, the ideas our ideas sit on, what is challenging them has nothing to do with a faction. It's to do with a massively increased information flow. We see the rupturing that racked Europe in the wake of the printing press changes the terrain of ideas. Ideas can come out. When you can control all the ideas within a culture, simply by writing heretical tomes on a list and sending it out to the monasteries, who are the ones who do the writing, it's actually really quite straightforward to control the entire narrative of a whole continent to keep that narrative within certain bounds so that everything that is spoken has a place within the foundational understanding. When you start bringing out a printing press, all of a sudden that becomes significantly more difficult to control. When you have the internet, well, the only way you can control it is if that's the only thing you do. If you see something like North Korea, North Korea actually does quite successfully control the narrative inside its society because that's all it does. That's what it has to do. This might seem, in a way, to be actually quite a wonderful thing. We're not locked in these structures anymore. They are eroding and splintering under their own weight. So we don't have any of these assumptions, of course. Not us. So but I think there's another layer underneath these cultural assumptions kind of atomic assumptions, if you will, very simple, very basic assumptions that are too obvious to question. There's no point questioning them. Why would you? And so we don't. Assumptions like the basic existence of human rationality. Why would you question the basic existence of human rationality? I mean, we all know that humans have some rational capacity, don't we? I mean, after all, we do. We experience chains of reasoning. That's how we experience our thoughts. We can see them when we talk to people. That's how people talk to us. It seems so obvious that that's what's going on. The information age reveals many things, and I think one of the things that is writ large is was knocking on our door is that the ways in which we are attempting as a species to engage with our world lack traction. They keep spinning out. If you think a good example would be uh, global warming. I saw this thing on the internet, it, it perfectly summed it up, it was brilliant, it said it is a commonplace accepted piece of truth in many parts of the world that global warming is a hoax concocted by 97% of the world's scientists but exposed by a plucky band of oil tycoons and billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> and it is. I remember reading, again, somewhere, I can't remember where it was, it was just somewhere on, on the web, and someone pointed out that in order to actually rise inside many conservative factions, certainly in America, but increasingly in Britain, you have to ascribe to that before, the, before you get in the door. There's other things as well. I mean, you know, we are all witnessing the rise 
of a kind of shrill, tortured extremism that's coming up in seemingly every culture and every society. It plays out in a different way in different societies. Sometimes it's physically violent, sometimes it's just extremely vicious and shrill in its beliefs, but it's the same movement all across the world, and it's an, emer it's an emergent phenomenon. No one's controlling it. It's coming from the ground up. And it's completely impervious to reason, completely impervious. 97% of the world's scientists. I think that's an interesting thing because the way in which we comprehend a thing constrains the way in which we can engage with it. If human rationality is part of how we comprehend each other and ourselves, then we think, well, of course, this is how we would engage with other humans. Of course, we all get emotional. Of course, we have irrational moments, but there's some basic level of rationality, then what we need to do is construct a case, build an argument, get the evidence together. As long as we get all the evidence in place, that'll work. And not only is it not working, it's not working in a really visible, obvious way that's genuinely spectacular to see. The sort of, it's not that you know, human madness or human irrationality, even though calling it irrationality sets the frame with rationality at its center, which is interesting. Even though all this is going on, the madness, the incoherent weirdness of these extreme beliefs, is just, it, 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 it's front and center. It's really open, it's really extreme. So we're really bad at reason is interesting. But there's another thing that's been exposed as well, which is that while we're really bad at reason, we're actually really, really good at rationalization. I mean, dear God, we're good. We're amazing. We're like the Leonardo da Vinci's of nonsense. We just, we, we, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, and, and it, it's not something that is a faculty that, that occasionally happens or just something that goes wrong. It seems to be almost like the default state. And there's another question that spins off that, which is that if we're so spectacularly good at rationalizing and coming up with fictitious chains of reason that never occurred to buttress some idea we don't want to question, and you don't need to teach a child that, you don't need to you know, sit someone down and talk them through it in the way that you actually do need to do with arithmetic and mathematics. It's a worrying question, and it's which is the malfunction and which is the faculty? Inside our face value understandings of each other and ourselves, well, rationality, reason, logic, that's the faculty, that's what we do. Rationalization is when things go wrong. What if we've got it backward? What if all the times we think that, no, that's reason, that's reason, that's logic, there. We're just convinced by the rationalization. It's a rationalization we agree with, and so we don't interrogate it. We don't subject it to the same kind of analysis as we normally would. I mean, it's an interesting question, and it is slightly disconcerting as well, because it implicates us personally. Just as questioning the tapestry of belief of that crusader would implicate that crusader personally. It's not just some abstract idea. It's important. It matters. Because <laughs> our rationality is quite a basic strut of our sense of self, you know, of who we are, what we understand ourselves to be. It's just that... I think if we don't start interrogating it in a more serious way, we'll need snorkels to appreciate the future. Because when you look across politics, the economy, even our culture, you have to start to question A good way to interrogate the idea, I mean, the idea that there is literally no rational capacity of any kind in the human animal, 
is to ask the question from evolution. It's just a really weird thing. Why would we develop the ability to fake having a mind to ourselves and to others? Why would we do that? What's the agenda? And there has to be an agenda. Evolution doesn't mess around. It has very specific, very specific contour. It works in a very specific way. There is one idea from evolution that does seem an interesting fit. We're just going to have a look at it now. It's the idea of what's called an evolutionary display or a mating display. Now, we all know probably the, the classic idea of mating display is the peacock. This magnificent bird with just an absolutely spectacular tail. But it's not just the peacock. Across all sorts of different animals and organisms, the necessity to display evolutionarily, to display as a sexual display, is instrumental. And it's instrumental because evolution is not just about the survival of the fittest. Evolution has two engines, not one. You can survive for a thousand years. If you don't reproduce, it is to evolution as if you never existed. And so, as the other side, sexual selection. Can you mate? Of course, we run into a big problem with that, which is that, and it is a problem to our idea, well, my idea, I guess, of the mind is this mating display, which is that, a peacock's tail is a very narrow band communication. It's from male peacock to peahen. It doesn't have scope. It's just... That might not be fatal. It might not be fatal to the idea because we're not birds. We're apes. Apes are extremely social. Mating as an ape doesn't just mean impressing someone of the opposite sex. It means becoming part of a community different genders, different ages, different relationships to you. So a much broader scope of display might be expected. It certainly isn't actually that problematic. And if the mind is a fiction, it certainly does have a large scope. The other problem, this is uh, significantly more damaging, is that the mind's not particularly compelling. Rationality, just reason, logic, in a row, it doesn't have any kind of like serious, visceral pull. Something that's an evolved display, we would expect that. It would have at least the capacity to be seriously compelling. The mind, well, rationality, reason, it can be quite dry. It can be quite dull. So... How do we square this circle? I came across a book called The Master and His Emissary by a guy called Ian McGilchrist that provided an absolutely fascinating piece of the puzzle for me. And it was, it was this. In that book, which McGilchrist is a neuroscientist and psychiatrist, he's Scottish, and um, he came up with this idea, there's a, a popular idea, I'm sure you've all heard it or heard it bandied around, that the two hemispheres work, this left hemisphere does logic and the right hemisphere does emotion. That's a terrible and appalling fudge of what's actually going on, but what McGilchrist demonstrates, I think very successfully, is that there is a simplicity. It's actually even more basic than that. Of course, every event we have in the brain has some kind of presence across the hemispheres, but there are actually two discernible, one better way of putting it, takes on the world that each hemisphere has. And the best way to explain it is in terms of that and how. You have, say, I don't know, this glass of water. We have that it is here, the fact of it, the yes or no of it, the binariness of it, the conceptual yes, it is, no, it's not. But if it is, then you have how it is, what kind of water it is, what kind of glass, what shape of the glass, how the light refracts through it. 
what kind of colours come up through the glass, reflected from my fingers. It's quite beautiful. McGilchrist's idea is that human experience can be understood as having basically two primary colours, that, the conceptual matrix of things, and how, the contour of how those things exist. But I thought this was very interesting because it rooted back to the idea of a display. If you think of a peacock sitting there, it's got its tail up, spectacular. I mean, some, some of these things are wider across than my arms, but they're huge. And the tail has these quills, like all feathers, just made of feathers. You've got the quill in the center of the feather. And then you've got the fluffy stuff on the side. The quill itself is not particularly attractive. It's just the structure. It just holds it up. The fluffy stuff is what does the attracting. It's the color and the life. It's beautiful. But it needs the spines. It needs those quills in order to hold it in place, in order to make it make sense. If the human mind is literally not real. This is not something that's a cultural thing. This is evolutionary. But we have two hemispheres. One primarily concerned with facts and lines. The other primarily concerned with things like flavor, quality, color. We assume that what the brain is doing, well I assumed trying to point any fingers. But we assume that what the brain is doing is processing and pre creating this experience of life that we're all having. But what happens if that's an incidental side effect of its main role? A structure of rational content, ideas, concepts, facts, which, when filled in with flavor, color, life, create an incredibly compelling, utterly persuasive display, the display of the human self. If this is true, if we have misconceived the basic nature of humanity in such a profound way, then a lot of the dead ends in which we're stuck intellectually spinning our wheels, we might potentially be able to open up in a new way because the ways in which we have available to engage with something are constrained by how we understand it. There are a great many different fields of inquiry, like economics and politics, various things, that include the assumption that the human self is what it looks like. Many of them, especially I've noticed in economics, are butting up against a very different kind of reality, charting out new but very specific strangenesses, marking them as cognitive bias putting a label on them, sticking them in a pile to the side. What if it's not cognitive bias? What if it's not cognition at all? What if it's just the illusion of cognition? Because we're something radically different than what we think we are. And this is all very curious and interesting, but there is, well, I, I think it is, so I wouldn't want to put that on any of you guys. But um, there is one element that makes it to my thinking at least, very far from being an academic issue. And it's that when you look across the world, I think it's fair to say human beings aren't just artists of rationalization. We're artists of conflict, of suffering. We create division between each other. We ferment division. When you take the human self at face value, 
I guess the only way you can understand that is what, that people are idiots, we're ignorant. But if we understand the human self as display and having the agenda of a display, things like conflict, needless conflict, suffering, anxiety, depression, all the things that are starting to spike in the modern age as all the tapestries of belief corrode, can be brought into a new focus, not as a thousand different problems, but as one problem with a thousand different expressions. And it's that if we have the agenda of a display and our belief systems are crumbling around us, we must be seen. We must be vivid. The necessity, evolutionarily, to be seen, if this is true, is equal to the pressure we feel to survive. From evolution, there is e they, they give an equal weight. They have equal weight in the process. So when we are frustrated, we must find other ways to become vivid. And there are very few things as vivid as a screen. This is the first of uh, three talks I wanted to give. The second is going to go into an opportunity, I think. Using this understanding to develop a new way that human beings can use to communicate their own individual unique humanity in a way that is powerful and the stability of which does not depend on the context of belief. It's a very weird thing to talk about, I know, but I, if this is the shape of the lock, I think that's a fair candidate for the shape of the kind of key we need to unlock it. The third talk is going to discuss the potential in using something like this as the core of a new kind of distributed revolution in human nature, which, while it might sound wacky, is increasingly, I think, what it's obvious we need. Thank you all for listening. Okay, I'm going to take off the jacket. Let's do this. Questions? Firstly, when's that next talk? Uh, the next talk is 13th of next month. Um, it will be going... The 10th? I thought it was the 13th. Uh, it's the 10th. Yes, yes the 10th of uh, July. <laughs> but anyway. I'm just a talent. I show up and look pretty. I don't know any of this. Sorry. <laughs> well... When I can, when I can uh, twist someone's arm to publish it, but uh, it'll be finished at the end of this month. Then I'll be kicking it around to literary agents and such. But no, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling, I'm feeling positive about it. it makes sense to me. So uh, it's called Strange Terrain, and um, yeah, I mean, it goes into a lot more detail about all of this. I'm just trying to sort of hit the core notes for everyone, but. Um, yeah, no, I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy how it's looking. Um, but thank you. Thanks for asking. I'll, I'll give you a fiver after for setting up that plug. It's great stuff. All right. Sir, I have to leave I'm so from the Jack to Bus across the water to Dust Damn it. Now, I'm following your argument, and I'd like to communicate with you. Uh, I have Asperger, as you felt this. Yes, I know you told me. And one of, my, one of the benefits of Asperger is the ability to describe imaginary places. I have weird dreams, woken up at the start, as Joseph Conrad did. Okay, look, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, like, I, I, I have to ask, do you have a, do you have a question? In this? So, uh, well, can you create something entirely original, which is a value to mankind, uh, as a result of your own unique experience? Basically? Well, I'm trying. <laughs> That's kind of kind of what what I was hoping this might 
contribute towards. So, uh, so but anyway, so question behind Rick. Uh, yeah, um, we talked about um, so each year that you have a problem with the other stuff, and you have to establish how to make it. So if you're wanting some sort of a revolution, is this something that would be not only on a personal level, but also perhaps on a Yes, yes, yes. That's a, that's a very good question. I, sorry if, if anyone didn't hear that. Um, he was asking, like, if if we're looking for a, a revolution, is it a revolution like in the sort of power structure or in our in the human relationship to power itself? Do you think that thinking is in itself a revolutionary act? No, <laughs> I, I think I think I, I I would I would hope that it can be part of one, but no, in and of itself, no. Um, I think what Certainly what I think the potential of philosophy is, um, and I don't think this is being truly exploited, um, is that, again, I mean, it comes back to what I said. The way in which we have to engage with a thing do is constrained by how we understand it. If we can step back and, you know, far enough and, and, and understand something in a different way, if that is true, you know, it, 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 the truth matters. You know, it matters that... If, if what I'm saying here is false, then it's just, you know, pretty noise. Well, <laughs> noise. <laughs> don't, don't assume. But, um, but stop. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that what inquiry can do is open up new options for, you know, for human beings to, to like, change the terrain of options in front of someone. Um, so that's that's what that's what I, I, I try. To what extent, if any, is your interest in this driven by um, opposition, perhaps, to the imperialism of the field of inquiry known as economics and the definition of human nature, no short hand, homo economicus, as we know, it is hugely imperialistic and vastly yeah, yeah, yeah. successful for decades. Yeah. It, it does sound as if much of what you used to have inspired again. Uh, no, that's 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 a really interesting question because I'm sorry the answer is no. Um, I actually only came to economics quite recently, it, it, really through um, the work of Daniel Kahneman, uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, these guys, and then looking at uh, Taleb. Yeah. That's very. Yeah, 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 really. Um, and uh, we're looking at um, the work of, sort of a guy called Dan Ariely. Sorry, I'm just giving out names here, but if anyone. Uh, Wants the, black to, one. the Black Swan, yeah. Um, Nassim Taleb wrote a book uh, on anti-fragile guys, a philosopher of chance and probability. Honestly, it's brilliant. If you get a chance, click through. Um, but no, um, I feel that what is happening is that there's a convergence. There's a lot of people are converging um, on a certain kind of way of looking at the world. Um, I do have a, a great number of sources. There's a lot of people whose work I've leaned on to, to sort of to put what I've put together together. But... Um, no, economics wasn't really one of them. The whole economics ties together. The vast majority of academics in the English-speaking world for mm. decades already. That's yeah. what I mean. It's, it's converged. It did converge. Yeah. Like, actually, it still works. Most of it as what it's called the science that named economics. Yeah, yeah, science. Sure, sure. That's pseudo scientific, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think economics is absolutely fascinating because it's it's... <sighs> In the world in which we live, the kind of central ideas of, of philosophy don't tend to come out of the discipline of philosophy because it's very heavily oriented towards uh, logic and rationality. And <laughs> I, I hope I don't have to go into too much detail why I think that's a bad idea. But it does kind of lock down um, really kind of inquiry into human strangeness. Which is, I think, a uh, very, uh, you know, very fruitful um, way of looking at it. The thing about economics is that, of course, like, you know, in that field of inquiry, human strangeness comes to you. Like, you know, when we put out our theories about how the world works and organize it in that way, and then all of a sudden, it explodes because we got something very basic wrong. Then, you know, out, out of that. Sorry. The problem is that it's the finest. Well, I think there's I think there's some really interesting work coming out of it. Um, not from the sort of mainstream, but but from I mean, Taleb is very much a, a sort of I don't know, <laughs> aggressively dissident figure. Um, but he's brilliant, you know. He's brilliant, and you know he's um, he's I getting through. I, I I think I think his work is really strong. Um, but 
we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll discuss that another time. Um, anyone else? So, go. Yeah. Um, do you think that people are starting to realize that we're being obvious about certain things, like, for example, comparing where we are with feudalism and going, hold on a minute, yeah. we're not meant to be in that same yeah, yeah. anymore, we're supposed to have advanced, and, yeah. but now we have a different set of barons, we have a different set of people that are above us, yeah. we're going to find people having the same amount of wealth as the, 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 the 12 million, I think it was? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So are we now starting to come to a conscious decision that we don't want that anymore? Yes, I th well, I think that there is, how to put it, like, I'm going to reference Twilight in my answer, so please forgive me, but I promise it will connect in. I promise you. I'll make it work. Trust me. All right. The thing about Twilight is that before watching that, I found the superficiality of Western culture amusing. I was just like, <laughs> look at this silliness. Look at this Transformers movie. What is this nonsense? As soon as I watched Twilight, now I think actually quite a lot of people, it, it, it's almost like the superficiality becomes so good at being superficial that it just knocks people out of the entire system, just knocks people out of what's going on. I think what we see, I mean, that's happening in culture. You look at, I don't know, I mean, if you think of the sort of, uh, I don't know, the, the bands, the pop commercialized bands of like the 1980s and 90s, like, I don't know, New Kids on the Block or MC Hammer and stuff, and we could look back on those and think, oh, but, you know, it, you know, it was kind of nostalgic. The thing is that the modern versions of those things like One Direction or Justin Bieber and stuff, they're not really doing anything fundamentally different. They're doing it, if anything, better. It's, it's much more, it's bigger, it's, it's, it's slicker, it's smoother, it's, it's, more, it's, it's just a much more, in a metaphorical way, I'm not saying anything like, like this is actually going on, but like, it's a much more evolved beast. You know, it, they, they just, they're just much better at doing this. But the thing is, when they become better at being superficial, it just knocks a lot of people out. And, 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 once, and, and then you get this weird thing that I think is becoming, I hope, much more common, which is that it's another emergent phenomenon, which is that people are just starting to feel like strangers in their own culture. You know, I, I know, I, know I, I feel that way sometimes. Like you, you just look around and think, well, what is this nonsense? Who is listening to this music? Who is reading it? And the answer is that a lot of people are. There's a lot of people out there who are fans of all this superficiality. But the superficiality has kind of gotten so aggressive and extreme that people are being pushed out. Now, to come back to the sort of economics thing, the reason I bring it up is that I think this is happening all across in all sorts of different uh, arenas, different fields of endeavor. Um, politics, for instance, uh, you know, with like the rise of UKIP. It's, it's not just the rise of UKIP. The rise of UKIP the kind of Tory party's attempt to sort of do the splits between a kind of moderate position and these extremists and then kind of Labour pulling up the rear trying to cobble together some focus group idea that's, and the entire thing, it's not so much that it's bad, it's that it's transparent. You can see what they're doing and it's just like, ugh, like what is this nonsense? Like, oh my God, this is awful. And it, it, it's like, I, I mean, it really, I, I do hope it's a kind of emerging sanity. You know, and, and that's why the sort of anti-political thread in our in our times which is quite aggressive you know a lot of people bemoan it I think you know I think maybe perhaps we do need to disengage from all what's going on not to sort of burn it all down with pitchforks and, 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 and torches but just to sort of reconsider at a very basic level what's happening and see if we can come at it in a different way with economics yeah I mean it's it's it, it's just it's not so much that we live in feudal times it's that it's so naked that we live in feudal times. You know, it's just so extreme and really intense. Many people don't want to think it. Many people don't like it, don't like thinking about things like that. But a lot more, you know, a lot of people are finding themselves in a position where they have to because it's really impacting their life and, and it's really obviously impacting their life. And I think that's the, you know, I hope the... the uh, group, demographic, whatever you want to call it. The, and, I mean, it's, it's transgenerational. It's from all sorts of different people, all sorts of different sides. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think something can be done with it. But again, it can't just be discontent. You know, we need focus, a specific focus, different you know, ways to understand what's going on that give us a clear way to sort of unite this and go forward while not spinning out into ideological madness because that is of course the obvious big problem with any kind of revolution so it has to be something different i hope i
some somewhere in that rambling rant was an answer. Sir. Anyone else? Guy at the back. Um, you, your, your conclusion and your objections seem quite tremendous in the sense that you sort of predict the potential sure. revolution. Um, and forgive me if I'm making um, false rationalizations there because it was a uh, wonderful talk. I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you if you forgive me. <laughs> Go on. Um, is there a risk here that in predicting such tremendous consequences, you, based on these sort of these shifts in ideas around the evolutionary display, etc., you risk creating um, new uh, new terrain and a new orthodoxies? Yeah. yeah, 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 sure. I mean, yes is the answer. Yes, yes, it's a risk. Um, and and, that, and it's not just a risk. In a way, it's the risk. You know, like, it, it, it's, there's going to be issues. There's going to be problems. Um, there's no, I, I know, I really, I, there's no magic bullet to this. But just the fact that there's no magic bullet doesn't mean there isn't a bullet. <laughs> but it's... We have to change the, I, I guess the change needs to occur at precisely that level, you know, would, would be my response, that, that, if that makes sense. That instead of thinking, like, are we risking a new orthodoxy, a new tyranny, you know, a new kind of hierarchy? Well, firstly, the, the fact is that kind of no, because it's very hard to spread ideas of any sophistication that aren't basically saying, you know, four legs good, two legs bad. That's the kind of thing that the sort of information flow of our world tends to sort of light up, um, which is why I think, you know, when you look around at the kind of shunt to sort of extreme simplest, sort of extremist simplistic narratives all over the world, you know, the, that's what we're seeing. You know, just the, the fact that those things thrive on a rapid flow of information. Um, but at the same time, could there be something else? Could there be something that is genuinely changing it at that, at that core? And if there is, yeah, it's still a risk. Yes, it could be done badly. Yes, it could be used. But I mean, I, I guess the, the, best, the best I can hope for is to say, well, yes, but if there's something that was done well, could it, in principle, potentially work? And if that answer is anything more than maybe, I think that's a solid play. You know, like, I think that if there's a serious chance that we might actually be able to change the tape, you know, then it's worth, it's, it's worth going for because the option is we will get a job in Tesco, basically. <laughs> Let's be honest. So, uh, any, other, any other questions? First, sure. you know, first, you mentioned him and uh, the master of the answer yep. and his description of the human brain as having separate functions, but coordinated and um, accomplished yeah. so, no, so we have an integrated brain with yeah. an integrated function. Now, if that's the brain that's given us all this shit sure. all along, yeah. how do we change it? Centuries, yeah. Ever since, um, you know, evolutionarily, ever since it began. Yep. Uh, you're proposing a certain massive shift, but I'd like to know how. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I, c I could go into it a little bit here, but th that's what the second lecture is about. And that kind of, and I, I don't mean to be facetious, but it is, as you say, a very, it's almost like a massive shift. It's, it's just a very elemental shift, and it's a very basic shift. It doesn't so much come after all our ideas, it's so like come before them, like to step back from it turn 90 degrees on the entire thing and come at it from a different angle. The essential opportunity that I think sits in all this is that when you look at the human self, it's not precisely like a peacock's tail. A peacock's tail is a static structure, you know, where you have the specific spines, the quills. I think they're called the vein, V-A-N-E. That's the middle of the feather, and then the fluffy bits are called the rachis. Um, but anyway, you've got it, it's set up, it's like a static structure. The thing about the human self, if it is a display, is that it's very fluid. And if I could think of any one thing to compare it to, it would be something like birdsong. You know, like the, but not in terms of just the sort of notes that we, 
that we come out with, but the sort of like the ideas and the concepts and everything flows together in like a kind of ongoing narrative display. The thing is that much like the peacock's tail, though, the actual expressive force of this display isn't necessarily linked to the to put this the structure itself isn't the bit that does the attracting it isn't the bit that does the compelling what does is the flavor the life the color if there is a way that can be developed to switch essentially the primacy of these two things so that it's instead of a kind of belief based humanity where we leverage larger and larger, more extreme, more divisive beliefs in order to light ourselves up emotionally. If we can essentially detach the scale of an idea from the expressive force of it and cultivate ways to do that, then potentially there's a way to yeah, move. It's mm. impossible. Sorry. It's impossible. I, I, I believe it is. I, the, it's uh, impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> sorry to hear you say that. God bless you. God bless you. But frankly, human beings are not able to do Look, I, I believe that they are. And I believe that there's a specific way. I'll talk about it next time, but I'm sorry, I can't go into no, it. Um, look, if you, if you, no, really, if, you, if, you, if you're skeptical about it, by all means, please come to the next thing. I, I'll, I'll, lay out, I'll lay out the idea I've got. And, you know, God if, bless you. I'll come. Cool. All right, anyone? One. The examples of display that you mentioned, are they specifically meeting displays yeah. performed by males and both attracting females? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah it's, it, it obviously, in, in, um, in humanity, that's not the case. If, if this is a mating display, then it's, it's of equal development in both males and females. Because the thing is, like, as an ape, if we're going to display rationality is gone. Uh, let, let me let me let me answer that question first. Um, the thing, if it's a mating display, then I mean, like, like I said, the, the peacock doesn't have a group of other peacocks that it needs to impress, so that it can become friends with them all, no, and then and then yeah, select exactly, one. Frankly, exactly. The male is the exactly. To the yeah. 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 Bird song is always the male sure. singing. Sure. 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 To the yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And that's not true of humans at all. It's, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't think... I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 the only reason I use peacock is because everyone knows it. And, and the only reason... But, it, yeah, very much... Thank you. I, I'll tell you what, I'll... Um, could you give him my email address? Could you write that down? Um, yeah, no, sorry, like, uh, if I could think of any female mating displays, I'd use them, and, so, um... So you, but you see, if you keep saying mating display, so, I mean, are you very specifically meaning mating display? Yes, so there but, yes. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, look, I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd happily interrogate it in different ways, but I, my, my assumption, my sort of, I, I guess where I've got to is that I think this is what's going on. That what you have with a, an ape is a much more broad scope and this, I, I try to I try to reference it in the talk. I, I hope I, I didn't rush over it too much. But when you need to enter a community in order to be eligible for some kind of you know like partnership, then that has to be you know then the display itself. I think it's not untenable to think that it is a mating display, but it's just of a much broader scope because apes just have a much broader social scope. <laughs> Culture, which yeah. I'm certainly. I, look, look, please, please, please. I'm. I'm certainly not trying to. Sure. Sure. Okay. Look, I mean, I mean, I was just trying to illustrate the point of displays in general, um, and and sexual displays in general. Um, so were they male to female? Features? Just, you know, if you're going to use the word display and you're going to use examples, it's really quite helpful. All right. All right. If you're saying it's not just a male meeting display, you know, it's something. Sure. I'll check it out. I'll check it out. I'll, I'll have a look into it. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else? 
No, we're good. Let's go get loaded. Just, can I have your attention for one, one minute? Can I? Hello. Attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just before, before we close the evening, I'd, I'd like to. Uh, I, I put a lot of stock in. We learn through conversation. We learn through dialogue, and um, that's that's where we're coming together around lots of lovely food that I hope you'll help take away and not let go to waste. On the 23rd of this month, there's a lovely opportunity to be involved in great conversations. I look, the Edinburgh Philosophy and Psychology Group is meeting over at the Lynx Hotel. Uh, I always enjoy the conversation that goes on in there. And next month, uh, July 11th, there will be two more talks here at 7 p.m. More food, more conversation, more people to meet. Thank you all.